Good morning, my name is David Burke, if you don't know me, and I am your trustee on duty today. On behalf of Reverend Donna Maurer, the Board of Trustees, and our awesome practitioners, I am privileged to welcome you to the Sonoran Desert Center for Spiritual Living. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual path, you are truly welcome here. You will be validated, supported, and encouraged to be all that you were meant to be. Our vision statement is love in action every day in every way. We express this love by learning and living the principles of the science of mind. On the back of our program, you will find our Declaration of Principles. Please join me now in reading them. I believe there is an intelligence operating throughout the universe. I believe this intelligent power is only good. I believe this intelligence expresses as me. I believe through my conscious use of this power, I create my life as happy, healthy, and complete. And so it is. Do we have any first timers today? Do we have any? Oh, yeah, so do you mind reintroducing yourself? So you're going to move here soon, right? <laughs> oh, well. Oh, great. That's awesome. Anyone else? Yeah. My son, Josh, is here. He's returning. Um, from Michigan, so I'm happy and psyched to have him here. Um, uh, we uh, invite everyone to stay after and get to know each other and give hugs and just say how much we love each other um, and have some of the wonderful food that's out there. Uh, I would like to thank all the people that made the Sunday celebration happen make it special and so on. There's so many, people do so much. Uh, we really appreciate all of you, but especially you in the seats, that's what keeps us going and keeps the vibe in here awesome. If you are joining us for the first time today, welcome again. And please refer to the first page inside your bulletin for the words for our Namaste song. The God in me beholds the God in you. It is all for our greatest and highest good. The God in me 
exalts the God in you, and you and I are one. Namaste. The God in me beholds the God in you. It is all for our greatest and highest good. The God in me beholds the God in you. And you and I are one. Namaste. Namaste. Good morning. My name is Louise, and I am your practitioner today. And I am going to light the service candle, just knowing that this service is infinitely blessed today. The practitioners are the healing arm of the church, so if you would like prayer, um, we have a request uh, forms over there, and just write your request and put it in the box, and we will pray for, your, for you today, or whatever your request is. So take a deep breath, and just get comfortable. You can close your eyes if you like, and just know there is one power one presence, one infinite intelligence in the universe. I call it God, and I know that God is all there is. And just as I am one with this one, so are each and every one of you one with this power, this presence, this infinite intelligence. This one is joy, peace, love, harmony, creativity, and vitality. This one is the voice in the silence speaking its truth that love is all there is. And now I affirm that we are each love. I affirm that this service today is love and all here are one with this love. We are each this love. It is manifesting in and through us. And I know that Donna's words that bless and inspire us are one with this divine wisdom and love. And we anchor this by saying, and so it is. So my reading is out of the April 2019 Daily Guide. And it says, choose peace. There's a couple of quotes. So, peace doesn't, in, doesn't require two people. It requires only one, and it has to be you. The problem begins and ends there. No matter what confusion appears at the surface of your life, there is always a place of calm at this center of your being. If I truly want peace in my life, I'm the one who must choose it. I have daily opportunities to opt for peace of mind instead of irritation. Traffic, a spilled drink, a flat tire, a crossword. Everyday practice makes it easier to access that peace when problems arise, which allows solutions to surface. It's so easy to fall into, oh no, in hard times. Fear is activated and my mind starts swirling with everything that can go wrong. This reaction leaves precious little room for positive outcomes. Peace and the possibilities that come with it is available if I and if we choose it. Being peaceful doesn't mean becoming a doormat. In fact, it often takes grit to choose peace. It may necessitate walking away from people or situations that no longer feel peaceful. This doesn't mean the other people are wrong, but that the person who's changing, the one who chooses peace, is you and me. When I'm upset, I may talk it out with someone I trust with the intention of healing whatever needs to be healed. Then I go on with living my best life which doesn't include gossip or complaint, 
Instead, with gratitude in my heart, I look for everyday delights, and that's what I talk about. The universe responds, bringing me more of what I focus on, including the happiness that comes from peace of mind. As I let go of anything unlike peace, I invite serenity into my life. Choosing peace takes continual practice, but it sure is worth it. Peace begins with me. I consciously choose it because I deserve, we all deserve, a peace-filled life. Namaste. So I take this candle and hold the high watch for each and every one of us during this service. Started, I would like to uh, 
to take a moment to think about Memorial Day and to pay tribute to the men and women who died in service to our country. You know, as, I, as I wrote in the E! News, growing up in the Midwest, <clears throat> Memorial Day meant that school was out and the local parks opened their pools. To me, it was the beginning of summer and all the fun things that went with it. I had no idea of its true meaning. In 2000, Congress passed the National Moment of Remembrance Act, asking people to stop at 3 p.m. and just remember. So tomorrow I would ask each one of us to take a moment at 3 p.m. and stop and give thanks for those who sacrificed their lives so that we can enjoy the freedom that we have today. Reverend Scott Aubrey on his website shared a cute story. On Memorial Day, the minister noticed little Alex was staring up at the large plaque that hung in the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names and small American flags. The seven-year-old had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up and said, good morning, Alex. Good morning, Reverend, replied the young man, still focused on the plaque. What is this, Alex asked. Well, son, it's a memorial to all the men and women who died in the service. Soberly, they stood there together, observing the plaque for some time, and little Alex finally asked, which, which service? the nine or the 11. <laughs> well, our topic this morning is the wisdom of the heart, and our theme for the month is good to great to grand. You know, I believe that the heart is the seat of the emotions. It's the place where we find that which is the best in us. It's a place where we in touch that intuitive guidance that is spirit speaking through us. And I think our evolution from good to great to grand is dependent upon how open our heart is, how ready we are to see beyond appearances to something greater, how willing we are to trust that the universe knows what it is doing, not only for the planet, but for each one of us. Our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, says, the person who goes deeply into her, his or her own nature will find that God speaks in a language more subtle than the human language, without a tongue, in that universal language of spiritual emotion, which is instinctive in humanity and in brute, and held in common by all civilization, by all creation, by all people who have lived, the universal language of emotion, sense, feeling, intuition, instinct. Sometimes we call it conscience, sometimes we call it a hunch, sometimes we call it a vision or a dream. It makes no difference what we call it. It is a direct revelation of omniscience through us. You know, all this month we've been talking about this idea of walking in two worlds about how most of the time we live in a world of experiences or a world of facts. And that's because that's the world we know best. That's the one that we get up with and, and it confronts us every single morning. <clears throat> but we know that there's an inner world as well. And in that world, facts are transcended by a higher truth, what Hermes Holmes calls direct revelation of the omniscience or the all-knowing through us. And I would like to call this direct revelation or divine intu intuition the wisdom of the heart. We know we are experiencing this wisdom when we are guided by love, which is the highest expression of God. You know, facts may tell us we have the right to be angry, but love tells us that forgiveness heals. Facts tell us that we may be in an economic downturn. Love tells us that life is abundant and God is our only source. Facts tell us that we die. Love shows us the eternality of life. In the writings of Carlos Castaneda, Don Wong, the young shak the, uh, yaki shaman that is his teacher, tells Carlos, there is no destination. 
There is only the path. Just be sure your path has a heart. When we allow love to be the guiding light in our life, then our path will always have a heart, no matter what is going on in our world of affairs. Roberto de Vincenzo, renowned Argentinian golfer, once won a pro tournament with a substantial cash prize. After receiving the check and smiling for the cameras, he went to the clubhouse and prepared to leave. Later, as he walked to the car, he was approached by a young woman. She congratulated him on his victory and then told him that her baby was seriously ill and near death. She didn't know how she would ever pay the doctor or hospital bills. Roberta was touched by her story and took out a pen and endorsed his winning check over to the woman. Make some good days for the child, he said as he pressed the check into her hand. The next week, he was having lunch in a country club when a golf association official came to his table. Some of the boys in the parking lot told me you met a young woman there after you won the tournament last week. He nodded. Well, the official said, I have news for you. She's a phony. She has no sick kid. The girl fleeced you, my friend. You mean there's no dying baby? That's right. DeVinzo replied, that's the best news I've heard all week. <laughs> you and I don't have control over what other people do, but we, have, we do have control over our response. DeVinzo gave his money freely and was so pleased to find that there was no sick baby that the money didn't matter to him. That's a path with a heart. That's the wisdom of the heart. So the meaning of any experience is the meaning that we give to it. We're always at choice point in our lives. We can choose to see through the eyes of love or the eyes of judgment. The person or situation we judge probably won't be affected by it, but we will. The person that we love from afar probably won't be affected, but we will. And if we judge or condemn ourselves for making a stupid decision, as Roberto certainly could have, then we only make ourselves miserable and we're not being true to the love that we are. So once we take an action, any action, if our intentions are pure, then we're not responsible for what others make of what we do. Because the universe settles everything into its right place. And our business is to live with a whole heart, act in harmony with our values, and find peace in our own integrity, regardless of how others may think or see us. In the play, The Sleep of, of Prisoners by Christopher Fry, are these words. The human heart can go the lengths of God, dark and cold, we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of century breaks, cracks, begins to move. The thunder is a thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to face us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul men ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are you making for? It takes so many years to, it takes so many thousand years to wake, but will you wake for pity's sake? The human heart can go the lengths of God. To me, that's one of, that's one of the most profound statements, um, and I hold it close in my heart. And I see it played out in the world. When I lived in Los Angeles, I heard a man speak at a 12-step meeting of his horrific past. He was an alcoholic and a drug addict. He had a wife, also an addict, and a small child who was often neglected. In fact, the little girl was teased in school because she smelled bad. She could never count on being fed, so she kept bits of decaying food in the pockets of her coat. 
And one day a puppy followed her home. She was playing with it when her father came into the room. He saw her so happy and so loving to this puppy that in a drunken, jealous rage, he took his gun and shot the puppy out from under her. Both she and her mother did not flinch or show any emotion because they knew that if they did, they would be next. The man who told this story went on to tell of his and his wife's recovery from their addictions. They became actually happily married. They healed this situation. And the little girl grew up to be a runway model, which took her all over the world. And the man, when he was speaking, was so proud because he said, when she's out in Europe, I can count on her to call me, spend a few minutes talking with me, and end her conversation with, good night, Daddy, I love you. The human heart can go the lengths of God. You and I have the ability and the resiliency to transcend every hurt, every wound, every resentment, and travel that higher path through the wisdom of our heart. And we find that we do have a place in this world and a purpose that is far beyond those labels we put on ourselves. We see that the world is our classroom and every person is our teacher. And when we see the world through the wisdom of our heart, then we become a part of that planetary shift in consciousness. And I think that's what Christopher Fry means when he says, the frozen misery of centuries breaks, cracks, begins to move. Through the wisdom of our heart, we can dispel the centuries of seeing each other as separate and as apart. Centuries of egotistically thinking that one group, ours, is right and the other is wrong. Centuries of believing that war will bring peace. Centuries of seeing ourselves as victims, buffeted around by outer experiences. Centuries of looking outside ourselves for our salvation. The world we see through the eyes of love is far closer to reality than the one shown to us by fear or judgment. It's certainly more peaceful and joy-filled, and it's the only one that will move us from good to great to grand. We develop an attitude of gratitude and enthusiasm for life that transforms ourselves and all who step into our sphere of influence. We become what Ernest, calls, Ernest Holmes calls spiritually self-reliant. He says, people with spiritual self-reliance have a deep conviction that they are tuned to an infinite intelligence and that they are one with the all-knowing spirit. A knowledge of this truth is, is necessary if we desire to develop an understanding that will cause us to be positive without aggressiveness, that will make us sure of ourselves, without egotism, that will make us strong in action without becoming intolerant. First of all, there must be an awareness of the presence of God. Next, and equally necessary, is faith in the spiritual self. The faith to which we are referring is not a faith in an isolated self which struggles through life alone, but faith in an inner knowledge. Spiritual reliance comes only to those who have a deep awareness of the availability of the creative spirit through the medium of their spiritual self and their oneness with the presence of God. Rabbi David Cooper uh, wrote a book called God is a Verb, and in it there's a story. Once there was a king who discovered that his entire supply of grain had been contaminated by a strange fungus. There, were, there was no way of knowing anything was different except for one little problem. Anyone who ate this grain lost all contact with true reality. In simple terms, when a person ate this grain, he or she became deranged. The king and his advisor were the only ones who knew about this problem. They discussed their options. They were rapidly running out of uncontaminated grain and there were no alternatives for feeding the nation. 
In two more days, they would have to open the contaminated storehouse or all the people in the kingdom would starve. A new grain supply would not be ready for almost a year and there was no assurance that even that would not be contaminated. At first they thought they would give the grain to the people but would not eat it themselves so that at least two people in the kingdom would maintain their sanity. Then the king realized that he would not be able to govern the masses if he did not understand what the people were thinking. So he suggested that he should eat the grain, but that his advisor should stay sane. Then the advisor realized that it would be impossible to give advice to the king if he were, if he were seeing true reality, but the king was not. They understood that in order to rule a kingdom of people with a different reality, they both had to eat the contaminated grain so that they could see things like everyone else. The only hope for the future of the people was a possibility that someone would realize that they were what they were experiencing was not true reality. So the king and his advisors put out an edict to the people that everyone was required by law to put a mark on their foreheads. And every morning when they saw the mark in the mirror, they were to ask, what does this mean? The hope was that people would wonder why everyone was obliged to ask themselves this question, and eventually, at some point in the future, this mark would lead the nation to the realization that their reality was illusory. This is where the story ends. We never find out what happened because, in fact, we are still living the story. <laughs> The mark on our forehead is the yearning to connect with the divine presence within. We haven't seen it that way because we've been living in and of the world of outer affairs and the insanity that it often brings. Thank God our time is now. The connection we make with, the, with this divine presence is the beginning of sanity. As we begin to look from our heart, we see that everything we touch, every person we meet, are unique manifestations of spirit, and coming from the love of God within us, we bring forth the divinity in all of that. Indeed, our affairs are soul size. We are called to go the length of God, to walk that path with a heart. We are called to our own spiritual reliance and to follow that deep inner wisdom, and in so doing, we wake to the magnificence that is in us and in all things. Our enterprise is exploration into God, into that divinity that is our very nature. It's an exploration into the very depths of who and what we are. We no longer question the mark upon our forehead. We are awake to the glory that is all around us and within us. We are awake to the love of God that is available to us at every moment. And through the wisdom of our heart, we find that we too can go the links of God. Thank you, namaste. Thank you. If you would like to stand, you're welcome to.
do it one more time. We are the heart, we are the hands, we are the voice of spirit on earth. And who we are, and all we do is a blessing to the world. Thank you. So it's time for our offering. Um, chance to put that divine law of circulation in process. And I would ask you to join me in our offering an affirmation on the left-hand side of your bulletin. My gift goes forth to heal, prosper, and bless all that it touches. It is evidence of my conviction that God is the source and substance of my supply. I share generously of my good knowing that it returns to me multiplied abundantly, and so it is. Thank you so much for your generosity, which allows us to be generous within the community and, and to keep this beautiful little, little piece of paradise you know, here on, on the Amato territory. So thank you so very much. So we'll take a moment. We're early, so we'll take a moment to close it out in prayer, and then please join us for refreshments. And if you're kind of new to us or... If you haven't, if you don't remember Tim or haven't met him, please take a moment to say hi to him and encourage him to come to come live with us. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, I know that there is one God. There is one mind. There is one divine intelligence, and that divine intelligence animates all creation. So you and I are that divinity as it is expressed in the world. And as we seek the wisdom of our heart, then we are that piece of God expressing its greatness, its grandness to the world. I know we have the power to speak our, world, our word and exact change. So I speak my word now for anyone who's experiencing any kind of a problem, discomfort. And know that right where that discomfort is, is the power and presence of God. And not only for us as individuals, but for those places that are war-torn, 
that seem hopeless, we know that as we hold that vision of love, change does take place. I give thanks to be a part of this spiritual family and to feel the blessings that it brings to John and me each and every week. And I release these words into the law of mind to do its perfect work as we say together. And so it is. Thank you. May we stand and sing stand. So let there be peace, I am a stand for peace, let there be love, I am a stand for love, let there be joy, I am a stand.